facts and point forth. That's the third lecture of your, his, his mini course. Okay, uh, so thank you. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, sort of shift gears a bit uh, in today's lecture with, uh, in comparison with what I spoke about in my first two talks. And uh, indeed, what I say today is very much in the spirit of Professor Boato's lecture on Tuesday in that I would like to explain uh, how one can sometimes use ideas that originated in celestial mechanics to study certain classes of solutions of the point vortex equations. And uh, again, uh, uh, for that part of this lecture, which represents my own work, uh, it, it's, it's joint work with Anna Berry, who's now a postdoc at the IMA in Minnesota, and one of my colleagues in Boston, uh, Dick Hall. So, and uh, just uh, some references. Uh, so the paper of Anna and Dick and myself. And then for general references on uh, the end vortex problem, there's this very beautiful book by Paul Newton. And then finally, something which unfortunately I hope to talk about, but I think won't, there won't be time in the end with. Uh, it, as I said, the, the, the general th sort of theme that I want to uh, promote in today's talk is that one has very powerful tools in classical mechanics that you can sometimes bring to bear on these vortex systems. And one terrific example of that, which I think time won't permit me to really go into, is an application of the, the sort of Kolmogorov-Arnold-Moser theory to the point vortex system uh, uh, due to costas kanin So, so uh, we've seen these equations uh, on a number uh, of times already. So these are the equations, the ordinary differential equations that describe the motion of n point vortices in a, an inviscid fluid. Uh, so we'll assign to each vortex its strength, gamma i, and then the location of the, the center of the vortex uh, moves according to this system of differential equations. And so let me, I probably want to re refer to this, so let me write it here on the board. It, it turns out it, it's also very convenient to write these equations in terms of the complex variable z, which is x plus i y, and then you see that uh, z i dot is just uh, 1 upon 2 pi sum over j not equal to i. Uh, I guess gamma j over uh, z i minus z j complex conjugate. Uh, that's probably true up to at least a sign. I mean, maybe there's a, a sign missing there. So, okay, so I think I think that's right up to the sign. So, so. okay, so so we'd like to understand these. Uh, the solutions of these equations. And uh, again, as has been remarked on, in a number of lectures this week, these equations are actually a Hamiltonian system. That is to say, if you take uh, the energy function in which uh, different vortices uh, interact according to the logarithm of the distance between them, then it's a very simple exercise to show that the equations uh, from the previous slide uh, have this Hamiltonian form. So, so uh, that suggests uh, using the, the tools of classical mechanics. And, and as we'll see, that at least in some instances, those can provide us with quite a lot of information. So uh, as always, when talking about classical mechanics, it's a good idea to think about what, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Then when you look at the Lagrangian picture, the trajectory is also Hamiltonian. 
second question is both Hamiltonian but in a different form. Yes. So I guess this is what we were trying to talk because I was confused for one year myself that when people say here's the Hamiltonian proof is going to do for the Lagrangian yep. and the Marshall and Tom is a huge Hamiltonian talk about the integral of the Epsilon and the And I, I have to say, th th this is somehow different from either of those in some sense. Well, so Okay, so it, yeah, you're fault, but it, it's a consequence of the fact that the, the vortices are advected by the, the velocity field of the other which vortices. Is, which which is yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So good. So very good remark. Yeah. So so. Yeah. No. Very appropriate. Yeah. So very appropriate. So um. So as I say uh. So when studying classical mechanical systems, it's often a good idea to look for conserved quantities. So certainly the, the energy, the, the, the value of the Hamiltonian function is conserved along trajectories, at least as long as these uh, vortices don't collide with each other. And we've seen examples that show that that can happen. Uh, the, the, the analog of the momentum is the, uh, these quantities in the middle, and then a, sort of an analog of the angular momentum which is just the sum of the strength of the vortex times the square of its uh, displacement. Now, one uh, thing that causes quite significant differences in terms of the phenomenology of these vortex systems vis-a-vis, -vis, say, uh, the n-body problem of celestial mechanics is that, in some sense, the vortex strength is playing the role like the mass in these classical mechanical systems. And, and so the fact that you can have both positive and negative vortices uh, makes the, uh, be, uh, gives you the possibility of, of finding quite different uh, phenomena than in the case where you only have positive masses, as is true for celestial mechanics. So uh, again, a uh, fact that's very uh, common in Hamiltonian systems is that if you uh, have a conserved quantity that can allow you to reduce the effective number of degrees of freedom. And by using the uh, sort of conserved quantities on the previous slide, one can show that for systems of two or three vortices, uh, one always has uh, an integrable Hamiltonian system. And in fact, uh, for two vortices, we've already seen uh, exactly what the possible trajectories are in earlier lectures this week. So uh, uh, if you have, uh, well, uh, except for the case in which you have two vortices of equal and opposite strength, in which case they move along a, a parallel line. In other cases, they'll just rotate with a uh, fixed angular frequency about their center of vorticity. And in, uh, when you have three vortices, much more complicated types of motion are uh, possible, but still the system is, uh, completely integrable. However, uh, there are actually rigorous proofs that for four or more vortices, the systems are not integral, integrable. And typically, one can have extremely complicated uh, uh, motions of the system in those cases. Uh, nonetheless, even in these uh, sort of non-integrable cases, uh, you often find there are sets of initial conditions, sometimes relatively large sets of initial conditions, for which the motion is regular. And, and so one example of that uh, is the uh, uh, paper I alluded to earlier in which one can apply uh, the kolmogorov arnold moser theory to construct uh, sort of large sets of initial data for which one has quasi-periodic motions of these vortices. Uh, now, uh, as we remarked for the two vortex problem, that the typical situation is that these two vortices uh, rotate around some common center with a fixed angular frequency. Now, that's just a sort of elementary integration of the differential equations for two vortices. But it turns out, uh, surprisingly perhaps, that this is a very common phenomenon even when one has more than two vortices. Namely, uh, one sees many examples in nature in which one has a collection of vortices that rotate uh, with a fixed angular f frequency, but in a rotating frame of reference, maintain their relative separation. So, so one example uh, is actually uh, sometimes in a hurricane, 
So uh, again, uh, we've, uh, it's been remarked on in earlier lectures that uh, hurricanes are, are uh, uh, an example of vortex motion in two-dimensional fluids. But in fact, very often, uh, hurricanes have fine structure. And so uh, if you look here in the core of this hurricane, you'll see that uh, the core is not a uniform uh, region of vorticity. But in fact, there are, uh, in, in this case, I guess, uh, uh, five distinct uh, sort of regions of vorticity within the core. And they, uh, at least for uh, relevant time scales for the existence of this hurricane, that is to say, time scales of, of several hours, those uh, vortices just rotate in a fixed relationship to one another. So another uh, place where they, these are seen, these are actual experimental figures here. Uh, it, th these are sort of electron columns in a magnetic field. And if you uh, write down the equations of motion, you find that uh, these electron columns uh, move according to the same equations that describe uh, point vortices in an inviscid fluid. And, and so here again, these are different experimentally observed configurations uh, in which the uh, vortices rotate uh, with a fixed angular frequency while uh, maintaining this same uh, relative position uh, relative to one another. Uh, the other thing I want to point out here, and this is also characteristic of many systems in which these things are observed, we have one sort of dominant vortex, one vortex which is much larger than the others, and then a number of smaller vortices. And so I'm going to focus in on that particular situation here in, in this talk. And, uh, and wh what I want to point out here, because this will come up later on, is that these uh, these configurations seem at least experimentally to be stable, uh, uh, but they're definitely not symmetric. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, I, I want to sort of stress the analogy with sort of classical mechanics, and in particular with celestial mechanics today, and, uh, and point out that uh, this situation where you have one vortex that's much larger than the others is uh, the, the analogous situation in celestial mechanics is very common where you have one very large mass sum surrounded by a number of smaller masses. So we have many planets in the solar system with a, a, a large collection of small moons. You could think of this as some kind of idealization of a ring around a planet. Uh, so so, uh, so uh, the analog of this situation of one strong vortex and a number of weak vortices has been very much studied in uh, celestial mechanics. And, and uh, people have developed uh, really uh, very powerful tools for analyzing these types of uh, sort of rotating configurations. And, and we'd like to uh, take those tools over and try to apply them in this uh, point vortex context. And one thing that I, uh, we'll see, I'll sort of give away the punchline here, is that the, the tools transfer very naturally, uh, but the predictions they make about the phenomenology of the system turn out to be very different. And so there's this, this nice uh, situation where you, you can carry over the tools, and uh, the sort of the boring answer would be, well, you take the tools over and you find the same thing in the point vortex system as in the celestial mechanics system. But it turns out you, you can take the tools over with no problems, but the predictions you make with those tools turn out to be, be very different. So, so there, uh, these uh, uh, systems that we're, we're going to study in which we have a, an array of vortices that rotate with fixed uh, angular velocity while maintaining their relative separation, they're sometimes called vortex crystals. And there's one obvious one, uh, and that was sort of uh, the one that we saw in the hurricane, if you like, and that is you can take n vortices of equal strength and place them at the vertices of a regular polygon, and then that configuration will rotate with uh, fixed uh, angular velocity uh, if you choose the speed of rotation correctly. You can also, uh, and this will be relevant for our discussion, uh, add a, another vortex at the center of this polygon. And that additional vortex can be of the same strength as those at the vertices of the polygon, or it can be of different strength. And we'll want to look at the limit in which it's much larger than the ones 
at the vertices of the polygon. And so, as I said, these uh, regular configurations are, are similar to those that uh, were observed in the hurricane, but not at all like those uh, uh, sort of non-symmetric situations that we saw in the experiments on electron columns. Uh, finally, as I, I remarked, these uh, types of uh, configurations have been very much studied in celestial mechanics, and there they're typically referred to as relative equilibria of the system, and I'll, I'll sort of oscillate between calling these things relative equilibria and vortex crystals. So I use those two terms interchangeably. So we'll uh, start out, as I said, by taking one large vortex whose uh, strength I'll normalize to be one, and we'll uh, uh, sort of surround it by n small vortices. And I'll, I'll make the simplifying assumption that, that all of those vortices uh, have the same small strength, uh, which I'll call epsilon, but uh, I will allow for the possibility that epsilon can be either small, uh, positive or negative. So I'm not going to assume necessarily that, uh, that the small vortices have the same uh, sign as the large vortex. Uh, we'll allow for the possibility that they change, and we'll see that that produces dramatic changes in, for instance, the stability of the resulting configurations. And so, uh, so we're going to use a technique here that's very common uh, in celestial mechanics. So, so, uh, so I don't know if anyone is sort of an expert in celestial mechanics here, but, but if you've gone to talks uh, about celestial mechanics, you, you may have heard people talk about the two plus one body problem or something like that. And so, so what that refers to is a situation which, as I say, is very common uh, in, in, the, in the solar system, for instance, where you have uh, uh, one uh, mass that's very much smaller than the other masses in the system, and so you, you take a limit of the equations of motion in which the mass of one of the bodies goes to zero. And then one finds that the equations simplify uh, considerably in that limit, and then one would like to understand the solutions of this limiting system and use the information about that limiting system to then draw conclusions about the original system in the case of small but non-zero mass. And so that's the, the kind of strategy we'll apply here. We'll take this system in which we have one vortex and n small vortices. We'll take a limit of the uh, equations of motion in which epsilon goes to zero. We'll find that that uh, limit uh, results in a system of equations that's very much easier to analyze than the original point vortex equations, and then we'll use the information about the solutions of that limiting system to draw conclusions about the original system when epsilon is non-zero. So that's the, the strategy here. So uh, just a, as a definition, uh, so there's this... Uh, this distinction between the n plus 1 and the 1 plus n vortex problem. And this uh, uh, is not done solely to confuse the audience, but really is uh, an, an analogy, an attempt to, 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 to draw an analogy with celestial mechanics. Remember I said that the 2 plus 1 body problem refers to the limit in which you take the mass of one of the three bodies to zero. And so here we have a total of n plus 1 masses. We'll take the limit in which n of the masses go to zero. So, so the limiting problem will be called the 1 plus n uh, vortex problem because we've taken uh, the, the strength of n of the vortices to zero. So this is uh, an, an analogy to attempt to sort of mimic the terminology from celestial mechanics. And so, so let's suppose we have a sequence of, of numbers epsilon k going to zero. So these will be the strength of our small vortices. Uh, suppose we have a sequence of positions, q0, k through q0, n. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be q0, epsilon through q, n, epsilon. The superscript should be epsilon because I'm interested in looking at a sequence of configurations that are relative equilibria or vortex crystals for the n plus 1 vortex problem. Uh, and I'm going to take the limit now as epsilon goes to 0. And if these positions, uh, q0 through q, n, converge as epsilon goes to zero to some limiting configuration, then I'll call that limiting configuration a relative equilibrium or a vortex crystal for the 1 plus n vortex problem. So, so here, these uh, positions q0 through qn with no superscript refer to a solution 
of the uh, point vortex equations in which I've taken the limit of uh, gamma j equals zero, uh, 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 gamma j going to zero for all of the sm small vortices. And as I say, uh, the only reason that that is of interest is we'll find that the limiting equations are much easier to analyze. Yes? Why is the limit not I'm sorry? Ah, so uh, it's because of the way the, the, the um, it's because of the way the, the strength of the vorticity enters the equation. You can sort of divide through the equations, as it were, or multiply the equations by the, the gamma j's. And when you take the limit, uh, some terms go to zero, but not all terms, okay? So there is a kind of non-trivial dynamics that still remains, okay? And that's not obvious, but, but, but it, it, it sort of turns out that when one does the calculation, that's what, what happens. So, okay, and then here, as I say, the, the terminology here is really uh, to try and uh, remind people of the analogy with uh, celestial mechanics. So uh, we can sort of normalize the angular velocity, as it turns out. Uh, and if you uh, have some sequence of uh, relative equilibria, and so here uh, the superscript K, I guess, refers to uh, the strength of vortex epsilon K, and epsilon K is going to zero. Uh, then, as I said, by uh, rescaling the angular frequency, you can rescale the angular frequency of any relative equilibrium to be one just by rescaling the relative positions of the particles, and, and there you just, you can look at the equations and, and see that that's the case. Uh, and the uh, important remark is that if, if this family of relative equilibria converges as the strength of the small vortices go to zero, uh, then, and if you make the assumption that the vortices in the family don't collide in this limit, so you want them to be bounded away from each other, then uh, you can show without much difficulty at all, just by a kind of direct analysis of the equations, and I'll show this on the next slide, uh, that the uh, large vortex uh, converges to the origin. Uh, so I've chosen coordinates in which the center of vorticity is at the origin. So the large vortex will converge to the origin, and all of the little vortices converge to the unit circle. Okay, so they can position themselves around the unit circle in all kinds of complicated ways, but they all will converge to some point on the unit circle. And as I say, uh, that's a, a very simple argument. So here I have taken the equations for the point vortices. I've rewritten them in a uh, frame of reference rotating with speed omega, so that's where this term comes from. And then I've used the fact that in this rotating frame of reference, the uh, relative equilibria or the vortex crystals are stationary, so the time derivative term just drops out. And so we see this is the equation for the large vortex, and as epsilon goes to zero, uh, this term drops out, Remember, we assume that the vortices don't collide, so the denominator's bounded away from zero. This term goes to zero, and so we see that C0 must also, the, the C0 is the location of the, the large vortex, it's gotta go to zero. And a similar analysis for this second equation uh, shows that as epsilon goes to zero, this term drops out. We know that C0 is going to the origin, and so Cj must approach the unit circle. So a very sort of straightforward uh, argument here. Uh, okay, so, so the relative equilibria of the limiting problem, the one plus n vortex problem, all lie on the unit circle. And of course now it's very easy to uh, parameterize points on the unit circle. We can parameterize them in terms of their angle with respect to some uh, fixed uh, axis, and that turns out to be the, uh, the key in identifying the uh, sort of relative equilibrium uh, relative equilibria for the limit problem. So, so now we're just looking at the equations for the uh, limit case in which we took the uh, strength of the small vortices to zero. And so the theorem is that uh, if you have some relative equilibrium for this limiting problem, and if you uh, express that relative equilibrium in uh, polar coordinates, okay, and that should be Q sub n, not a 1 sub n, sorry, uh, if you express the location of the uh, vortices in terms of polar coordinates, then we know that the radial coordinate is going to 1, and so the only uh, 
uh, real uh, variation occurs in the angular coordinates. And the angular coordinates turn out to be uh, a critical point of this potential function on the unit circle. And so uh, instead of having to analyze the dynamics of some system of two n equations in the plane, we can just reduce uh, the, the uh, search for relative equilibria, at least for the limiting equations, to looking for critical points of this function defined on the unit circle. And so that's a, a much, much easier task. Now, the, what the theorem uh, shows is that, says is that uh, if you have a uh, relative equilibrium of the limit problem, it's a critical point of this uh, potential function. The, the, the hard part starts when you want to go the other way to show that every critical point of this potential function corresponds to a solution of the, uh, the real equations with non-zero epsilon. So that's where the work will start. As I say, the, the proof of this theorem is actually quite easy. You just use the fact that uh, for any of these relative equilibria, the, the velocity of the vortex has to be orthogonal to its position. And if you just take the dot product of the equations of motion, represent the resulting equations in polar coordinates and take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, then you uh, find the uh, result of the theorem follows in a very straightforward fashion. So, as I said, the critical points of V are at least relatively easy to find, relatively rather relative to the, the, the task of finding uh, sort of uh, critical points or stationary points of some system of equations in the plane. Um, as I said, every family of uh, relative equilibria of the n plus 1 vortex problem converge as epsilon goes to zero to one of these critical points, but it's not uh, really clear at this point that you can go backwards, namely that you can conclude that every critical point of this potential function gives rise to a family of relative equilibria of the n plus 1 vortex problem. And so that's the next problem I'd like to tackle. Uh, so uh, clearly the way we would, uh, or a natural way to approach this uh, question would be uh, to uh, via the implicit function theorem, namely show that if you start from a, a, a solution of the epsilon equals zero case, you can use the implicit function theorem to conclude that problem with uh, small but non-zero epsilon also has a solution. Uh, for that to work, we'll need some kind of non-degeneracy condition. And here we run into a little bit of a problem uh, because of basically uh, the Hamiltonian structure of the problem. Uh, if you linearize the point vortex equations about uh, any relative equilibrium, you always end up with a number of zero eigenvalues. Uh, so so non-degeneracy is, is, is a problem, uh, but the, the good thing is, so this, this is sort of the bad side of all the symmetries that come from being Hamiltonian. The good thing is that, that you can identify, thanks to the symmetries, uh, the origin of these zero eigenvalues and basically just eliminate them by hand, so to speak, okay? So, so two of them come from the invariance of the center of vorticity. You can, you know, move this relative equilibrium to any point in the plane you like, and we can get rid of those just by uh, sort of uh, basically uh, dropping the equation for Q0. We'll just define Q0 to be minus epsilon Q1 through Qn, so that, uh, uh, that fixes it at the center of vorticity, and then we'll just ignore the equations for Q0, okay? So that gets rid of two of these zero eigenvalues. And what's the, what are the other ones associated with? Well, they're related to the rotational symmetry of the problem and this scaling invariance that I uh, remarked on earlier. And so, um, <coughs> so you could kind of, uh, you could, one way to try to tackle this is, uh, to, uh, would be to, you know, try to fix uh, one of the uh, QJs to lie on, say, the positive x-axis. Uh, it turns out that uh, it, it's a little bit easier, uh, in fact, just to uh, use the fact that since we know that this zero eigenvalue is associated with rotational invariance, we can compute explicitly the associated eigenvector, and then we just work in a subspace orthogonal to that zero eigenvector, okay? So, uh, so if you write out uh, 
the linearization uh, of the equations about uh, the uh, relative equilibrium, then you find it has this very uh, particular form, and this form will be important, namely uh, the diagonal. So these, these are, um, each symbol here represents an n by n uh, matrix. Uh, so so uh, in the, on the diagonal, the two blocks on the diagonal are just multiples of this matrix whose matrix elements are given by uh, the sign of the uh, difference in angles between two vortices, except for the diagonals, which are a sum of those signs. Uh, the upper right-hand block is to leading order just the uh, Hessian matrix for our potential function. And the lower left-hand block is just the identity matrix, or two times the identity matrix up to higher order. Uh, and the other thing uh, we will want to remember is that since our original system is Hamiltonian, this, this matrix is going to be a symplectic matrix, okay? And so that will, of course, help us in identifying the eigenvalues. So uh, now we, we said originally the linearization has uh, uh, four zero eigenvalues. We got rid of two of them by fixing the center of vorticity. So there are two left. So this matrix M is always going to have two zero eigenvalues. Uh, we'll define it to be non-degenerate if it has exactly two eigenvalues. And uh, then it turns out that a, 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 the next theorem that we, we prove is that if you start from any critical point of the potential, so this will give us then, uh, so if we start from any p critical point of the potential uh, that is non-degenerate in this sense, so that the, the only uh, zero eigenvalues of M are those associated with symmetries, uh, then in fact, that point uh, one theta star does correspond to the limit of a sequence of relative equilibria for the original epsilon non-zero problem. And uh, one point to uh, stress in this theorem is that uh, we get relative equilibria both for small epsilon positive and small epsilon negative. So at this point, the existence theory for these relative equilibria makes no distinction between positive and negative values of epsilon. As I say, the, the, the proof is, is just the implicit function theorem. The only uh, difficulty is in dealing with these zero eigenvalues. But we basically, as I say, we know what the form of the associated eigenvectors are because they're associated with these symmetries. And so we just sort of by hand work in a subspace orthogonal to these eigenvalues. So here you can, can write down uh, immediately, for instance, the eigenvalue associated with the rotation invariance. So. Okay, so that's the existence. Uh, so, so we now have a theorem that uh, tells us, or at least allows us to identify families of relative equilibria in the uh, uh, point vortex equations. Can we use these same ideas to say something about stability? And it turns out we can. And so uh, here we, we draw very heavily on a paper by Rick Merkel, who uh, looked at the analogous problem in the celestial mechanics pro uh, c context. And uh, what we will uh, do here depends very much on the Hamiltonian nature of the problem. We'll, we'll use the symplectic structure of this linearized matrix to deduce information about the spectrum of M just from a knowledge of the spectrum of the Hessian of the potential function, okay? And remember, all of the information about the limit problem is encoded in this N by N matrix. And we'll, from that, be able to deduce information about the spectrum of this 2N by 2N matrix. Okay. Uh, we're going to focus here on linear stability, uh, which in the Hamiltonian context means that all of the eigenvalues of the linearized equation are purely imaginary. So, uh, and for instance, here's a, a lemma. If, uh, if you want, you can try to prove this. So uh, if you have any, I suppose that the eigenvectors of, of M uh, satisfy the property that when you take the, uh, uh, when you evaluate that eigenvector with its complex conjugate in the symplectic form. So this is just the dot product of V with J times V complex conjugate, where J is the, the symplectic matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 0. Then if uh, all of those uh, inner products are non-zero, then the eigenvalues are purely imaginary. 
So that's a, a little exercise in symplectic matrices. Um, uh, and how are we going to use that? Well, well, we'll just verify that indeed this condition is satisfied for the eigenvectors of the matrix M. Oops, where did it go? The matrix M that results from linearizing uh, the point vortex equations. So, okay, so, so here's the, the theorem. Uh, let's suppose that we have this family of relative equilibria for the epsilon non-zero equation. Suppose that they converge to an equilibrium for the limiting problem where uh, we're going to assume that the uh, limiting uh, relative equilibrium is a non-degenerate critical point of V. Then if here the sign of the vorticity becomes important, if the small uh, vortices have the same sign of vorticity as the central vortex, then this limiting, uh, then the uh, okay, maybe I okay. So if if the if the uh, small vortices have the same sign of vorticity as the central vortex, then the configuration, the relative equilibrium, will be linearly stable if and only if uh, the critical point of V is a local minimum. Conversely, <coughs> if the small vortices have opposite vorticity from the central vortex, uh, the a relative equilibrium will be stable only if uh, the limiting problem corresponds to a local maximum of the potential. So, so we can identify stability with the uh, properties of the associated critical point of the potential function V. So uh, now uh, this is again uh, sort of very computational, uh, but we'll use uh, the fact, as I said, that, that we're dealing with symplectic matrices to uh, simplify things. Uh, so so we, we begin by uh, uh, recalling that uh, the fact that this limiting problem has a non-degenerate critical point corresponds to saying that, that the, the Hessian matrix of V has exactly one zero eigenvalue. And remember, we know it's an uh, eigenvector <coughs> explicitly. And then the explicit form of the matrix M, and then a, a, just a quite straightforward perturbation argument uh, to conclude that uh, the associated symplectic matrix M has two zero eigenvalues. So the, from the fact that M is symplectic, if it has one, it has to have two. Okay, and then from the form of the matrix M, you can show that since every other eigenvalue of V is a distance order one from zero, all the other eigenvalues of M will be at least a distance square root of epsilon away from zero. Okay. So, so we have already a little bit of information about the eigenvalues of M. We know it's got two zero eigenvalues uh, and no more. And we know that all the rest are, are some fixed distance away from the origin. But we don't yet know whether they're real, complex, or imaginary. Uh, in fact, we get a little bit more information about the uh, form of the eigenvalue. So every eigenvalue lambda of the uh, epsilon non-zero problem is of the form square root of epsilon gamma zero plus higher order terms, where gamma zero is a solution of, of this eigenvalue problem. And so now we just sort of go to work. Uh, so first of all, suppose uh, that epsilon is positive and theta star is not a minimum, then the Hessian matrix of the potential will have at least uh, one negative eigenvalue, which implies that there are at least uh, two real solutions, gamma zero, of this equation, one positive and one negative, and hence uh, two, at least two real solutions, uh, at least two real eigenvalues of the matrix M, and therefore this uh, configuration is unstable. It does not have purely imaginary eigenvalues. Uh, so, uh, so except for a minimum, the relative equilibrium is definitely unstable. And so the only possibility for stability is if we have a minimum of V. So let's assume that that's the case. So uh, if theta star is a local minimum of this, then you can check that this equation will have only uh, 
purely imaginary solutions, gamma zero. Uh, so if you then write out the corresponding eigenvalue for the, the full linearization M uh, and write out its uh, eigenvector as the radial and angular parts. Remember, I at some point said I'm going to work in polar coordinates, so I'm continuing to work in that representation. So, so then just from the form of M and the eigenvalue equation, the first thing you see is that lambda times the radial part of the eigenvector is order epsilon, and so since we know lambda is order square root of epsilon, we conclude that the first component of the eigenvector is order square root of epsilon, and then you make a very similar consideration for the second component, and you find that the second component satisfies this equation. Uh, so uh, since vr is order square root of epsilon, then you see that v theta will be order one. And so uh, in particular, if we normalize our eigenvector, v theta will just be one plus order epsilon. And so now you just go back and compute uh, the symplectic form uh, acting on v and complex conjugate of v using the fact that we know the form of all these eigenvectors to leading order. And it turns out that this inner product is just beta times square root of epsilon plus higher order terms. And hence, in particular, it's non-zero. Okay? And so since all of these inner products are non-zero, this general fact about uh, symplectic matrices uh, it tells us that all of the eigenvalues of M are purely imaginary. And so that's how we conclude the stability of the configurations for epsilon non-zero. So, uh, so now let's uh, talk about uh, some of the consequences of this. And in particular, I want to just tell you a fact about uh, celestial mechanics. Okay, so celestial mechanics So suppose you have one large planet and n small planets rotating about it. Then if n is greater than or equal to 7, there is only one relative equilibrium for this problem. Okay, there, so there's a unique relative equilibrium and it's stable. So there's a unique relative equilibrium. Uh, it's the regular polygon. And it's stable. Okay, so that's sort of relevant background information from celestial mechanics. So what do we learn about the corresponding uh, n vortex problem? Well, uh, suppose n is greater than four, uh, and suppose you uh, take your vortices. Whoops, sorry. Take your vortices and place them at the vertices of a regular polygon. Uh, then that is a relative equilibrium. But just by very explicit calculation, uh, using the fact that this matrix V theta theta, or, or uh, using this, the form of this matrix V theta theta, you can show that it has at least one positive and one negative eigenvalue. So that's, that's just a very explicit calculation. Hence, uh, theta star is neither a minimum nor a maximum uh, for uh, V. And therefore, uh, the corresponding uh, solution uh, of the n vortex problem is not stable. Okay, so it is a relative equilibrium, but for no n greater than four is it stable, and so that's really a very dramatic difference from the corresponding problem uh, in uh, celestial mechanics. Uh, so that's how you do it. Uh, so, um, so I should say that uh, this fact was actually known earlier. Uh, it was proven by quite different. Uh, methods by Cabral and Schmidt uh, 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 more than 10 years ago now. Uh, however, uh, this method using this uh, limiting potential V tells us a little bit more because, uh, okay, so the values of theta corresponding to a regular polygon are not the minimum of V, but it's easy to show that V does have a minimum and a maximum for that in, uh, uh, matter. So. The next thing we learn is that uh, 
in contrast, again, to the celestial mechanics problem, we have at least uh, three families of relative equilibrium for any value of n uh, under some re relatively mild non-degeneracy conditions. And uh, so, so there is a stable relative equilibrium, but in fact, it's non-symmetric, okay? It's the, the vortices are not arranged symmetrically around the uh, center vortex, and that's sort of comforting because uh, we saw these experimental pictures of electron columns, and indeed, the experimentally observed configurations were not symmetric. And so, so this is in, uh, in keeping with what was observed experimentally. Okay, so now, uh, so that's kind of the end of uh, what uh, uh, Anna and Dick and I did. And so now let me just conclude by uh, mentioning a few uh, sort of related and uh, more recent results by, by other people. Uh, first of all, there's been a recent interest in, in looking at the limit as the number of uh, vortices become very large. And so there's a, a, a very recent paper by Chen Kolokolnikov and, and Zhirov uh, who, who studied uh, sort of the limit in which the number of small vortices gets bigger and bigger. And they find that typically the, the stable configurations are kind of lopsided. So the, the, one, the, the, the vortices don't get distributed uniformly around the center. And, and they've derived a kind of integral equation to de describe the, the limiting uh, sort of density of vortices as n goes to infinity. Um, another situation, and, and uh, this uh, sort of connects up with Professor uh, Spurn's lecture yesterday. Uh, so, so these are experimental observations of vortices in Bose-Einstein condensates. And it's a little bit hard to see, unfortunately. But if you look at the original figures, uh, then you'll see in the, in the first two rows, one has configurations of three uh, sort of uniformly rotating vortices. And uh, in the uh, third and fourth rows, one has configurations of four uniformly rotating vortices, OK? And uh, the uh, model for the motion of these vortices is very similar to uh, the point vortices in uh, a, f a sort of ideal fluid. The, the only difference are, are these two terms here. And uh, those are associated with the fact that, that these uh, systems are typically subjected to some kind of confining potential. So you don't, you don't want things running away out of your experimental uh, region. And so the, they impose some uh, additional confining potential, which gives rise to these two additional terms in the equation. Nonetheless, uh, these equations are still uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, so Anna and uh, Panos Kevrakidis have recently uh, used methods very similar to those that I described to, to discuss the types of uh, vortices that were observed for, for these uh, quantum mechanical systems. Okay, so just to, to sum up, uh, I, I, I'd like to uh, argue that, that uh, we have available, thanks to celestial mechanics, a, a large toolbox of methods that one could uh, try to apply in the study of, of the point vortex problem. Uh, that, at least in this example, we see that even when one can transfer very immediately the methods uh, from one situation to the other, the predictions that one arrives at can be quite different, even in the very basic physical sense. And uh, finally, that there are other physical systems that uh, should be amenable, like these uh, quantum mechanical Bose-Einstein systems, which should be amenable to uh, similar analysis. And so uh, with that, I'd like to, to wrap up and just say once more how much I appreciate the invitation to participate in this really stimulating week. So thanks very much. <laughs>